Hola, and welcome to Spanish Answers, a podcast that gives you unas llavitas claves as you unlock your Spanish language adventure. I'm your host, Sarah, with Language Answers, and I apologize if the sound is a little weird today as I have just gotten a new computer and I'm still trying to get everything set up, so please bear with me. But today, we are going to begin looking at the six main uses of the word lo in Spanish. So, because there's so much to dive into, I thought I would break this up into two parts. So we'll focus on the first three in this episode, and in the next episode, we'll focus on the last three. So, let's get started! Low is one of those really versatile words in Spanish, and it can be pretty tricky for English speakers to wrap their minds around. Even I struggle with it. So, today's episode is going to give an overview on the first three ways that low is used in Spanish. Now, low can be used as one, a direct object pronoun, two, a neuter definite article, three, a neuter relative pronoun, four, combined with the preposition de, five, after the verb ser and estar, and six, in various Spanish phrases. Now, all of these phrases are a bit technical, and so they're unhelpful, in my opinion, so let's go ahead and dive into what it all means. Looking at number one, the direct object pronoun. Now, since this podcast slash blog is aimed at people who can speak Spanish at an intermediate or advanced level, I won't spend a lot of time on this one. But essentially, whenever in English you would say him or it as a direct object, that's when you would use lo. An example sentence or two would be, I like that car. I want to buy it. Me gusta este coche. Quiero comprarlo. Did you invite him to the party? Lo invitaste a la fiesta? Now, if you'd like to practice your Spanish while also reviewing the differences between direct and indirect objects, check out Episodio 48, Los Pronombres de los Objetos Directos e Indirectos, from my other podcast, Respuestas Inglesas. I've included in the blog a table from that episode that outlines which Spanish indirect and direct objects are used with which nouns. It's a really useful visual just to see the differences between indirect and direct because really there's only two. It's between lo, la, and le, and lo, las, and les. But anyways, moving on. One thing to bear in mind, lo can be used as a neuter direct object pronoun. That is, when the direct object is referring to something abstract, something vague and general, or something that was previously stated, then you can also use lo. And when you do, it doesn't need to reflect any specific gender plurality, like la or los. For example, I don't understand that. No lo entiendo. I know he says that, but he doesn't mean it. Sé que dice eso, pero no lo dice en serio. Note how both eso and lo are used this way. I hope to cover eso in a different episode. But anyways, again, that's I don't understand that. No lo entiendo. I know he says that, but he doesn't mean it. Sé que dice eso, pero no lo dice en serio. Number two. Lo as a neuter definite article. Now, this technical term actually hides something really cool about Spanish, which is that you can use lo and an adjective to create an abstract noun. The closest we have in English is the phrase the blank thing is, or saying general things such as that which is blank, like that which is good, or the best, as in that's the best. So here are some popular lo plus adjective phrases. Lo bueno, which is like the good, Lo bueno si breve, dos veces bueno. Roughly translated, it means that which is good, if brief, twice as good. According to the online Collins Dictionary, this is a Spanish proverb equivalent to our saying, brevity is the soul of wit. There's lo malo, the bad. Lo malo es que ahora ella no me habla. The bad thing is that now she won't talk to me. Lo malo es que ahora ella no me habla. The bad thing is that now she won't talk to me. Lo importante, the important thing. Lo importante es que nadie resulte herido. The important thing is that no one got hurt. You could also translate this as 
What's important is that no one got hurt. Lo importante es que nadie resulte herido. The important thing is that no one got hurt. There's lo difícil, the difficult. Lo difícil de inglés son las irregularidades. The difficult thing about English is its irregularities. Lo difícil del inglés son las irregularidades. The difficult thing about English is its irregularities. Notice how in Spanish you would use the plural form of to be, son, whereas in English we keep it as singular. This is based more on the fact that we have to use a different grammatical format to say what is being said in English. Anyways, lo mejor, the best. Eso es lo mejor, that's the best. Eso es lo mejor, that's the best. And then of course you have lo peor, the worst. Esta semana ha sido lo peor. This week has been the worst. Esta semana ha sido lo peor. This week has been the worst. Lo imposible, the impossible. Lograr lo imposible es posible con trabajo duro y fe. Achieving the impossible is possible with hard work and faith. Lograr lo imposible es posible con trabajo duro y fe. Achieving the impossible is possible with hard work and faith. Lo mío, that which is mine, what's mine? Lo mío es tuyo, what's mine is yours. Keep in mind, when we use lo this way, lo plus an adjective equals a new noun, then lo doesn't have to match a specific gender or plurality. It's always a singular neuter article, hence the technical name, lo. Taking some of the phrases above, or rather the phrases that I just said, you can get a better idea of what I mean. So for example, lo difícil del inglés son las irregularidades. Notice how the difficult thing about English, las irregularidades, are plural and feminine, but still we say lo difícil. Or in esta semana ha sido lo peor, this week is the worst, note how the subject is esta semana, but we still use lo peor rather than la peor. Now, if we were to say esta semana es la peor semana de mi vida, we would of course change lo to la because now we're using the adjective in the normal way to modify a noun rather than to be a noun. And so we would need to match the noun it is modifying and gender and plurality. So lo would become la for la peor semana. There's ha puesto lo mío en el piso he has put my stuff on the floor. While the implied stuff in the Spanish sentence would be cosas, we would not say las mías unless we specifically mentioned ha puesto las cosas mías. Again, this comes down to the difference between using lo plus adjective to create a noun and correctly using an adjective to modify a noun. And this brings us to number three, lo que and lo cual. These are both neuter relative pronouns. Now, lo que and lo cual are both used to refer to abstract and general terms or ideas, and lo que can be translated as what, that, or, as it is with lo cual, which. Because lo que and que can both be translated into English as what or that, knowing when to use which can be a bit tricky. There's a really great video by Real Fast Spanish, and I, of course, will include the link in my show notes. And um, this video does an excellent dive into this very question. However, it is over 15 minutes long. If you would like just a short gist, it's this. In a sentence that has two clauses connected by what, and what is followed by a conjugated verb that doesn't have an object, you probably need to use lo que. All right, even as a gist, that's a bit complex. So here are some examples to help explain. He knows what his dog wants. Sabe lo que quiere su perro. He knows what his dog wants. Sabe lo que quiere su perro. Now, the first phrase is he knows. What is the connection? And then his dog wants is the second phrase. And wants is a conjugated verb. It's not to want. Or in Spanish, it would be querer, right? The infinitive. It's quiere. So he knows what his dog wants. Two phrases connected by what and there's a conjugated verb that doesn't have an object in the second phrase. His dog wants. His dog wants what? I don't know, it doesn't say. 
So you would need lo que. Sabe lo que quiere su perro. Now, if you were to say, he knows that his dog wants to eat, then you would use just que. Sabe que su perro quiere comer. He knows that his dog wants to eat. Sabe que su perro quiere comer. So in this second example sentence, his dog wants to eat is the second phrase. And while wants is conjugated, quiere, it does have an object. His dog wants what? To eat. Another example sentence is, I can't understand what you are saying. No puedo entender lo que estás diciendo. I can't understand what you are saying. No puedo entender lo que estás diciendo. So the first phrase is, I can't understand. What is the connector? And you are saying is the second. So what are you saying? I don't know. It doesn't say. So there is no object. Now if you were to say, I can understand that you asked why in French. Puedo entender que preguntaste por qué en francés. In that situation, the second phrase is you asked why in French. You asked what? Why. So it does have an object. In that case, it would be que. I can understand that you asked why in French. Puedo entender que preguntaste por qué en francés. Here are a few more examples of lo que. And in these examples, notice that sometimes lo que begins the sentence. If this trips you up, you can simply rearrange the sentence to see the phrase one plus what plus phrase two set up. What you need to know in an emergency is in the pamphlet. Lo que necesita saber en caso de emergencia está en el folleto. What you need to know in an emergency is in the pamphlet. Lo que necesita saber en caso de emergencia está en el folleto. Now you could turn this into, you need to know in an emergency what is in the pamphlet. Necesita saber en caso de emergencia lo que se incluye en el folleto. What I need is chocolate. Lo que necesito es chocolate. What I need is chocolate. Lo que necesito es chocolate. And you could say instead, chocolate is what I need. Chocolate es lo que necesito. This is not what I wanted to say. Esto no es lo que quería decir. This is not what I wanted to say. Esto no es lo que quería decir. Now going back to when do you use lo que and que. If what is followed by an infinitive verb, then you use que. And in questions, what is que? So some examples. I don't know what to do. No sé qué hacer. Hacer is the infinitive verb, right? It's not conjugated. To do is the English infinitive verb. I don't know what to do. No sé qué hacer. He asked me what to bring to the picnic. Me preguntó qué llevar al picnic. He asked me what to bring to the picnic. Me preguntó qué llevar al picnic. What's up? ¿Qué pasa? What's up? ¿Qué pasa? What do you need? ¿Qué necesitas? What do you need? ¿Qué necesitas? And if you add todo to lo que at the beginning of a sentence, it turns it into all that blah 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 in English. For example, all that I have is yours. Todo lo que tengo es tuyo. All that he does is for you. Todo lo que hace es por ti. All that I can do is cry. Todo lo que puedo hacer es llorar. Hopefully not. All that I have is yours. Todo lo que tengo es tuyo. All that he does is for you. Todo lo que hace es por ti. All that I can do is cry. Todo lo que puedo hacer es llorar. So then, when do you use lo cual? Basically, whenever you would say which in Spanish. You can use lo que as well, but it is less formal than lo cual. My rule of thumb for when to use which is if you have two phrases separated by a comma, then you use which right after the comma. This is because which has to refer to something that was previously stated. So let's use some examples to highlight this. He tried to calm her down, comma, which is no easy feat. Trató de calmarla, lo cual no es tarea fácil. 
He tried to calm her down, which is no easy feat. Trató de calmarla, coma, lo cual no es tarea fácil. They took the stairs, which was a mistake. Ellos tomaron las escaleras, lo cual fue un error. They took the stairs, comma, which was a mistake. Ellos tomaron las escaleras, coma, lo cual fue un error. And that covers our first three uses of lo. In episode 57, we'll cover the other three. Lo de, lo after ser, and estar, and some fun phrases. So I hope this has helped you. If there are any topics you'd like me to cover, or if you have any questions, concerns, corrections, please email me at contact at languageanswers.com. So let's finish up our unique national holidays cultural tip regarding Argentina. Remember, last week I only did four of Argentina's 10 unique holidays to cut down on time. So this week we'll pick up where we left off at number five. So number five is National Flag Day. Paso a la inmortalidad del general Manuel Belgrano. This day, June 20th, commemorates the death of the man who created the first version of Argentina's current flag, General Manuel Belgrano. During the Argentine War of Independence, Belgrano realized during battle that both sides were using Spain's yellow and red colors. So, he created a new flag that used the same colors the Criollos used during the May Revolution of 1810, and the first flag flown was in Rosario on February 27, 1812. In 1861, the version that we see today became the official flag, with the sun included in the middle. Number 6. Martín Miguel de Guernes Day This takes place on June 17th, but was celebrated this past year on the 21st. I'm assuming this is so they could have a three-day weekend, since the 17th was a Thursday and the 21st a Monday. Anyway, this day marks the death of Martín Miguel de Guernes, an important military leader in the 19th century. Also known as the hero of the gauchos, he led a guerrilla force of gauchos, aka los gauchos de Guernes, after the 1810 May Revolution to defend the northwestern part of Argentina from Spanish invasions from Peru. He was important in the Battle of Suipacha, the first military victory for the Argentinians in November 1810, and his military successes helped the new government to become established and gave General José de San Martín the time he needed to raise his army, winning important battles in Peru and Chile. Guernes was, unfortunately, shot in the back in 1821 and died 10 days later on June 17th. Number 7. Independence Day. Dia de la Independencia. Always celebrated on July 9th, this day celebrates Argentina's declared independence from Spain on July 9th, 1816. Interestingly enough, it was the Argentinians' ability to fend off two invasions from Great Britain in 1806 and 1807 that gave them the confidence to fight for their independence. They created their first government junta in Buenos Aires on May 28, 1810, when they learned that Napoleon had overthrown King Ferdinand VII. Now, when Napoleon was defeated in 1816, delegates from the United Provinces of South America gathered at a home in Tucumán and declared themselves independent from Spain. Today, people celebrate the event with parades, family reunions, and military demonstrations. Number 8. San Martín's Day this day marks the death of Jose de San Martín and is celebrated on the third Monday in August. In case you hadn't noticed a trend, Argentina celebrates its heroes by commemorating their death rather than their birth. San Martín is regarded as the most important founding father for Argentina, as he was the main leader for their independence from Spain. He is considered one of the liberators of Spanish South America, along with Simón Bolívar. In fact, he is a hero in Peru, where they call him Fundador de la Libertad del Perú, Protector de Perú, Generalísimo de las Armas, and Fundador de la República. In Chile, where they call him Capitán General, and in Argentina, Padre de la Patria. The highest decoration you can get in Argentina is named after him, the Order of the Liberator, General San Martín. Number 9. Day of Respect for Cultural Diversity. Argentina created a public holiday on Friday before the Day of Respect for Cultural Diversity, which is their version of Dia de la Raza, as it's commonly called in Central and South America, or Christopher Columbus Day in the U.S. They did this basically to create a four-day weekend. 
So you've got celebration going from October 8th to October 11th. Now, the day itself celebrates the first contact between Europe and the indigenous communities, the day when Christopher Columbus first arrived, and is to celebrate the diversity among both people groups. In Argentina, they celebrate it the second Monday in October, just as we do in the U.S. Number 10, and the last one, Day of National Sovereignty, Dia de la Soberania Nacional. Celebrated on the fourth Monday of November, it marks the Battle of Vuelta de Obligado, which took place November 20th, 1845. What's a little odd about this day is that Argentina lost the battle. They had been trying to convince Uruguay and Paraguay to join their confederation and had raised tariffs to protect against colonial strength, which then led to the British and French setting up a blockade of the Rio de la Plata. Yet the British and French had such great losses that, despite their victory, they negotiated a treaty with Governor Juan Manuel de Rosas, who was the governor of Buenos Aires. Go figure. And that concludes our unique holidays look at Argentina. In the next episode, we will look at three unique traditions that they have. So it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Well, that's all for today. Thank you so much for listening, and don't forget to check out the show notes for links to the resources I used for this episode. If you would prefer to read an approximate transcription of today's episode, you can also visit the episode's blog. I would love to help you on your Spanish journey, so if you have any questions about Spanish culture or grammar, or if you need a personal tutor or language consultant for your business, you can reach me at contact at languageanswers.com or visit my website for more information at www.languageanswers.com. Remember, learning a language is a lifelong journey. Aprovechalo, disfrútalo y compártelo. See you in two weeks. Hasta luego. Bye.